Okay, welcome back everyone. We have our final panel of the day and of the conference. And it's fitting we end here on what is arguably the most important panel, which is how we take care of the health and welfare of artists. Um, it's no secret that except for the top, top earners in music, uh, most other people have a, a difficult row of it. And I'll admit, it's why I left a music career in my late 20s. I went to grad school and then ultimately law school. You know, I was doing reasonably well, but just looked at, can I, I couldn't even get a mortgage. I didn't think at any point in my life, can I even get a credit card uh, without, you know, usurious kind of rates. There was just so many problems confronting it. Um, kind of wish I'd stayed with it, but you know, the challenges are there, the challenges are real. COVID has made everything harder. And so how do we now then take care of our artists and give them the support networks they need? So that's the topic of this last panel. And we have an excellent moderator, John Good, from, of course, Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts. So just there's an organization that is really at the forefront of trying to help with this. And uh, we have other people on the panel from you know, Music Cares and places where we're looking at these things. So uh, I want to hand it over to John now. And just I really encourage our participants to really listen carefully and figure out how we can help support artists. Thanks, John. Take it over. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sean. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. I wish I had the... Uh, the foresight of Sean, I, I actually have a music degree as well. I wound up in law, but I am not a lawyer. I am an arts administrator who runs a legal organization. But um, yeah, who knew it was going to be uh, the struggle that it is, the gig economy. It's been my life. So um, uh, I am delighted today to be here uh, to moderate this panel. We have some really good speakers and they're going to have a lot of insight for everybody today. I'd like to take time to uh, introduce the panel now. Um, first, we have Mr. Udu Gray Jr who is the co-founder of House Studios. You do, you wanna wave there? Next, we have Jennifer Leff, who's the Senior Director of Music Cares. Jennifer, there we are. We have Eric Philbrook, who's the Vice President of Marketing and Creative Director at the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, better known as ASCAP. And last but not least, we have um, Professor Ying Zhen. She's with Wesleyan College. And uh, Ying is actually gonna kick off the presentation uh, order here today. I do wanna tell folks that if you have any questions during the course of the presentation today, you may post them in the chat box. Uh, we will answer questions at the end of today's session. So uh, by all means, post your questions there and we'll get to you as soon as the presenters are done. And with that, Ying, would you like to take over? Ying, you're muted, you're gonna need to unmute. Very good, okay. thank you. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Ying, I'm Associate Professor of Business and Economics at Wesleyan College. Um, and I'm also a fake pianist because I've been playing piano since I was a child and I love improvisation. Uh, as a member of uh, Music Industry Research Association, um, MIRA, uh, it was my great honor to work with a big name, uh, Alan Kruger uh, of Princeton University. Uh, on a uh, collaborative project. So we surveyed the well-being of musicians in the U.S. Um, and um, from April to June in 2018, and we worked closely together uh, from December 2017 to June 2018. You know, uh, I remember we exchanged um, about 324 emails and uh, Professor Kruger's uh, hardworking spirit always impressed me. And uh, it was a tragedy that he passed away last year in March 2019. Um, therefore, I've been very determined to continue um, our research and hopefully uh, we can expand our um, research um, to other parts of the world. As you can see from my bio, uh, I'm working on a book with my three co-authors. Uh, so we plan to uh, at least compare uh, the well-being of musicians um, in U.S. and China because based on my personal experience, lots of musicians in, in China are um, doing very well, yeah, especially financially. Yeah, so I'm, so, uh, I'm interested uh, and our team uh, would also be very interested uh, in finding out what would be uh, the reasons for such differences, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm glad to share uh, my collaborative research with uh, Dr. Alan Kruger. And so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, we can find our um, 
presentation slides. So here I wouldn't um, present every slide in details uh, due to our time constraint, but I'd be happy to share some uh, major findings. Yeah, so here you can find um, some details uh, or background about our uh, survey. Yeah, and also here you can find more about uh, Professor Alan Kruger. So it, it was quite a uh, tragedy. Um, okay, so here um, you can find information on our sample. We surveyed uh, 1,227 musicians and composers uh, from April the 12th to June the 2nd back in uh, 2018. Um, and uh, the Princeton University Research Survey Center um, helped uh, recruit uh, US-based musicians who were clients of Music Care CFO. Uh, our, uh, one of our panelists, uh, Jennifer, uh, is working for Music Care. So she'll be providing uh, you with more information. Um, and also, uh, our sample included others who were part of a list of music industry personnel uh, maintained by the American List Council. Um, and we target at um, those who earned a living as a musician or composer or who were endeavoring to earn a living through making music. Uh, therefore, apparently, I'm not eligible for, uh, even for taking this survey. Yeah. Um, and our sample is non-random, so this is a main drawback of, um, um, of our sample um, because it wasn't possible to recruit a large random sample of musicians uh, or one with known probability weights in proportion to their representation in the population. Um, therefore, our results should be viewed as providing an approximation uh, at best of the population of musicians. And in the future years, we hope to expand and refine our um, sample methods. Um, and also, we compared our sample with the American Community uh, Survey sample. Uh, then we could find um, some similarities and differences. Yeah. And from uh, the three tables you can see, right, race and ethnicity, um, gender and marital status, um, and also uh, age and educational attainment. Uh, so we can see that uh, our sample turns out to be uh, closely representative of the U.S. population of musicians in terms of race, ethnicity, uh, gender, marital status. Um, and women are underrepresented in the music industry. 35% uh, of musicians who responded to the Mirror mu uh, Musician Survey were female, um, similar to the uh, nationwide figure for musicians for the uh, American Community Survey uh, data. Um, and our sample is somewhat older and more highly educated uh, than uh, ACS musicians. And also our sample um, tended to earn a higher uh, income uh, although it was still relatively low. Yeah, so here we can see um, the median musician in the U.S. earned between uh, 20,000 and 25,000 U.S. dollars a year uh, in the period from 2012 to 2016, according to ACS data. Um, and the median musician in our, in, uh, in our sample reported earning nearly $35,000 in 2017. And here is a quick tour of finding our report. Uh, so our uh, research mainly covered three aspects. Uh, one is the career challenges that musicians face. Uh, second is the uh, drug use and abuse. Uh, and the third is uh, discri discrimination and sexual harassment. Um, okay. So here you can see the uh, top 10 genres um, U.S. musicians performed in 2017. So here last year um, was uh, 2017. So top 10 out of 25. And here you can you could find the top primary instruments um, that uh, musicians reported um, as their primary instruments. And um, this table uh, we we can uh, we can find. 
the favorite and least favorite aspects about me being a musician. Uh, unfortunately, the only positive thing I'll report um, is that, okay, uh, so from panel A, right? Um, so, uh, the, uh, so we asked, we asked the musicians to indicate what they liked most about being a musician and uh, what they liked uh, least. And uh, they selected multiple items. Uh, and they highlighted the opportunity for artistic expression, performing, and collaborate, uh, collaborating with others as the most preferred aspects of being a musician. So this is the only thing positive. Um, on the negative side from panel B, we can see that financial insecurity and time spent marketing themselves stood out as as the least preferred aspects of being a musician. Um, and a generally similar pattern was found for men and women and for whites and non-whites. And this table is probably uh, the most important for uh, today's presentation. So here we can find uh, the sources and shares of music related um, income. And um, the median musician earned income from 3.5 different sources in 2017, and the average musician earned income from uh, three different sources. Um, and uh, our survey found that the average musician earns two thirds of their uh, annual income from music related activities and one third from non music related sources. Uh, this table re uh, reports 17 possible sources of music-related income. By far, the most common source of income is performing live events. Yeah, so, so now during the pandemic, uh, this would be a huge challenge. Um, uh, let's see, so 81% of musicians earned income from live events in 2017, and these performances accounted for 42% of the average musician's music-related income. And the second and the third most common sources uh, of income music-related in 2017 um, were giving music lessons, 42%, and performing in the church choir or other religious services, uh, 38%. Um, and together with live performances, these three activities accounted for more than two thirds of the average musician's music related income. Um, as for the evidence on discrimination and sexual um, harassment, um, we can see that, um, so first women uh, are underrepresented uh, in musicians and women report, reported experiencing high rates of discrimination and sexual harassment. So in our report, 72% of female musicians report that they have been discriminated against because of their gender. And 76% report that they have been the victim of sexual uh, harassment. Corresponding to figures for US women, um, more generally are 28% and 42% uh, respectively. And 63% of non-white musicians said they faced racial discrimination as compared to 36% of non-white self-employed workers nationwide. And many musicians struggle with mental health problems. Um, so especially uh, we can see here, yeah, panel G, thoughts you would be better off dead. Yeah, so our report found that 11.8% of musicians reported having thoughts that you would be better off dead or hurting yourself in some way in at least uh, several days in the last two weeks, uh, compared with uh, only 3.4% for the general population. Um, and for the um, drug use and substance abuse, uh, so uh, the incidence is substantially higher among musicians than the general uh, public. So compared to the general U.S. adult population, uh, musicians are five times more likely to have used cocaine in the last month. 6.5% uh, no, no, times more likely to have used uh, ecstasy. 13.5 times more likely to have used LSD. 2.8 times more likely to have used heroin or opium. And uh, 3.5 times more likely to have used meth. And musicians are um, about twice likely to drink uh, alcohol frequently uh, than the population as a whole. So which means four or more times per week. Uh, so uh, compared to the general public, uh, so 31% versus 16%. Yeah, so they are the major findings of our uh, report. So here are several uh, next steps.
And uh, our book will uh, also examine the music labor markets and uh, especially uh, in the uh, uh, gender issues, we'd like to uh, examine to, uh, I mean, we'd like to expand to those transgender musicians and also the, uh, uh, the homosexual musicians. Yeah, so thanks for your time. Okay, I think John, you are muted. Yeah, I was saying it doesn't paint a very rosy picture for people who are involved in our profession, does it? Um, uh, Professor, let me, let me ask you, this data, just to clarify, was in, from 2018, correct? Yes. Okay, yeah, so but it, their, their income was based uh, on 2017. Very good. So just, just to make the, the audience aware, this does not uh, give us a snapshot of the State of the Union since the COVID pandemic has stopped. And I'm certain that these numbers have... Uh, have definitely changed radically uh, based on the pandemic and people's uh, situations right now. So thank you for that data, uh, Professor. Um, so not the most, uh, not the most eloquent uh, landscape for us to work within. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jennifer, uh, who's with Music Cares to kind of talk about what uh, resources may be out there to help musicians cope with some of the challenges they're facing right now. Jennifer? Sure, so um, Dr. Zen provided a great segue. Um, my name is Jennifer Leff. I am a clinical therapist and I'm the director of the East Coast region of Music Cares. And Music Cares is the charity of the Recording Academy. Many people know Music Cares as, or I'm sorry, many people know the Recording Academy as the Grammys. Um, the Recording Academy has a couple affiliates and um, we are their foundation. We are a safety net for the larger professional music industry. Um, and when we define a musician, um, it's quite broad. It's not just the singer songwriter, it is the promoter, the manager, the engineer, the videographer, um, the bus driver, because everything that's happening in front of stage can't happen without everybody behind stage. And they are integral to, um, to the industry. So what we do is if somebody is in a time of struggle, folks can call us and we are able to provide grants that go to a third party. Um, we do have eligibility requirements. One has to have at least five years paid professional work in the industry or show proof of six commercially released tracks. There's an application, there is a, an anonymous review committee, and a grant may be approved or denied. And then once approved, a grant goes to a third party. So if I'm applying for $100 for rent, the $100 will not come to me, it's gonna go straight to the landlord. So folks come to us for assistance around rent, utilities, um, medical bills, dental bills. We provide tremendous support around addiction and recovery. And we will facilitate folks getting to a rehab, inpatient or outpatient, or perhaps just psychiatric care. Um, sometimes just therapy sessions. Um, that certainly increased over these past years. We also provide access to medical clinics, dental clinics, and that's because historically musicians have never had insurance. So dental care certainly is quite prohibitive. The cost is quite prohibitive. Um, so we're able to have people receive a grant and access services that they wouldn't normally receive. We also um, have, presentations, panels, we used to do them in person. We have now obviously trans transitioned to webinars, but we are trying to really capture the needs of the larger music community and the diverse music community. So we have done programming on tax tips for musicians to mental health, to staying sober on the road, um, money management for women. 
we're really trying to capture the nuances of various communities and really get our kind of put our thumb on the pulse of what's going on. And when we see something that's coming up, we're going to try to address it. Um, we also do some assistance around natural disasters. And probably one reason everybody knows of Music Cares Now is because of our COVID relief fund. Um, and to date, we have assisted over 18,000 people and distributed over $20, 000, $20 million. Um, so it's a big amount. There's been a lot of fundraising, a lot of people coming together for this effort. And I think that the COVID relief fund really epitomizes why relief, entertainment relief organizations are so important because otherwise people are lost. Um, they're able to come to us, get money in an expedited fashion. We, um, we're very judicious with how we assess folks and we are not going to continually give the grants are time limited. Um, but in times of peril, such as now, people wouldn't have been able to buy food or pay one month's rent. Um, and so that, that's where Music Cares is at right now. Um, we've grown exponentially and we are here to serve the community, meet the needs of the community. That's awesome, Jennifer. Can you throw the URL out there so people can uh, go to the website? What's your uh, web address? Yeah, yeah, I'll type it in. <laughs> okay, awesome, thanks. That's a, a, a tremendous resource for uh, musicians in need right now, and I would encourage anybody to take a look at that if you are struggling right now and could use a hand. Music cares. All right. With that, let's uh, take it down to the street level and let's talk to some people who are actually out there doing uh, stuff on the music side. Let's. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Yudu Gray Jr. Uh, with uh, House Studios. Yudu, you want to take over? Yeah, thank you, John. So uh, that's that's a tough act to follow. Like you said, they're doing <laughs> massive things. Uh, but my wife and I started House Studios uh, 10 years ago uh, with a purpose to to support independent artists. And, and so we were recording studio, film studio, but really our niche was kind of helping artists set up LLCs, uh, set up their accounting, do all the back end boring stuff. But as a result, a lot of the artists we worked with early on found massive success, people like Logic and Wale and other artists from the DMV area. Um, my wife and I actually sold house earlier this year, right before the pandemic hit, had no tire connection. Uh, but uh, as a result of the pandemic, found ourselves having a lot of our artist friends kind of struggling and trying to get by. Uh, artists who were you know, either just starting out or more established artists who now had their careers kind of upended, especially touring artists, um, artists who had guarantees that were now no longer existing. And so our solution was really to work with the the, uh, the one place we knew money wasn't going to stop coming. That's the tech companies. Um, and so we partnered up with Amazon. We partnered with uh, Apple and Beats by Dre uh, and a few other companies to start creating opportunities for independent artists to get some of their projects funded. Uh, we have a couple projects that I can't really speak to. I was hoping to get approval before this, but I've been told I can't announce it yet, but I can say that. Uh, we are working with one of the tech companies to roll out a grant program in October um, that will allow independent artists to apply online uh, and pitch anything from a music video to studio time to anything in between. Uh, fully covered, fully funded, you own your masters, um, and there's just like a release window where it will be exclusive to that uh, tech platform. Uh, and those are the kind of creative things that uh, we see artists, uh, especially independent artists, having to incorporate as they're writing out their business plans. Because I think everyone now is finally caught on to the idea that an independent artist is a full-fledged business. Uh, something Jennifer spoke to is like, you know, when we think of an artist in music, you just think of the artist kind of a standalone, the person on the cover of the album. But behind that person, there are dozens of people who are tied to it, from the graphic designers doing the artwork, the engineers who are recording, the engineers who are mixing and mastering, the people who are doing the video treatments, the people who are working the video, and then eventually even now with live streaming, the people setting up the live streams and making all that happen. And so with these business plans and these business models, uh, we're working with artists to kind of take these ideas and say, hey, how do you put together a $5,000 video, pitch it to someone like a YouTube or an Amazon, 
and show them the impact that has on an, on an artist community. And we've seen success with it in real time uh, because right now no one really knows what they're doing. And, and, and that's, you know, when Live Nation is, is seeing 95% of their revenues cut and, you know, the labels who had these massive ideas are now pivoting, everyone's trying to figure out at the same time, how do we survive? And the little man's getting left behind. So again, for independent artists, our, our thing, uh, my wife and I's company is going to be 24-7 artists, or it is 24-7 artists. But our, our goal is really kind of taking some of these ideas with these artist communities, putting the groups of artists together to create more value. Because again, if you don't have the massive numbers of a Drake or a Nicki Minaj or you know Taylor Swift, you're probably not going to get the attention of an Amazon or a YouTube directly. But if you could put the right four or five artists together, then you can show numbers that a Spotify or an Apple, anyone would say, well, you know, if you guys got 3,000 listeners in the DC area, we can get behind this live stream project, or we can get behind this EP release. So again, a lot of these creative ideas that we're executing now are extensions of what we did with our company, House Studios. But it really is, you know, providing, like you said, on the ground in real time, if you're trying to figure out how to make money in a world where streams are paying out nothing and you can't sell tickets, uh, we're creating more collaborative opportunities where the money is. So not just ideas, but how can we pitch some of these things to the Amazons, Apples, Googles, uh, Quibis, Hulu, Netflix, uh, to create real, real-time real opportunities as well. And again, it, it doesn't affect everyone. So I think you've got to look at things like Music Cares and some of the other programs that you know, have 20 million or whatever it is to help out. But for those few artists who we can help in real time, uh, that's kind of where we're, we're trying to make our difference. Thanks, you do. Yeah, I, I know. I'm, I'm sure that everyone uh, who's listening in on the on the Zoom today is is experiencing the same pivotal shift. I mean, I know myself as an avocational musician, uh, I haven't played a gig since March 13th. I mean, they're just they evaporated, right? So my personal pivot is I'm I'm not an educator. I I have no patience for that. I'm afraid. But um, uh, what I have done is completely moved my studio stuff to where guys are sending me files now, and I'm just doing stuff from home and sending it back out. Right? It's all. It's all production from here, you know, from from ground zero anymore and, and no live performances. Done a couple of exhibition gigs, but, you know, they were for no money and trying to keep people to remember. Music is important. It makes you feel good. So, you know, remember about us out here. But but thank you for all the work that you're doing down there. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of questions in the in the chat box uh, coming sure. up here shortly. And with that, uh, let's go over to Eric Philbrook. Eric's Vice President of Marketing at ASCAP. Uh, and uh, Eric, what's going on for people to get their performances paid? And you are muted still. Here we go. Thank you. Um, well, let me, let me first just give a little, uh, you know, uh, broad view of what ASCAP is for those who may or may not know. We are, of course, one of the, the country's leading performing rights organization. Um, our main job is to get our members paid when their music is played publicly. We represent a diverse music community, all genres. Uh, people at all different stages of their career. Um, we have over 775,000 members, songwriters, composers, music publishers, and we license their music to businesses that play it. And that includes streaming services, radio stations, TV channels, Netflix, and of course, live venues from huge arenas to tiny clubs and restaurants, bars, website, anywhere that music is played. All those pl places pay us licensing fees. Um, for the right to play our members' music, and we send um, them back to our members as royalties. Um, and we represent over 12 million copyrighted works and process over trillions of performances annually at this point. Um, you know, the in, in most cases, ASCAP is the first organization that songwriters uh, um, will belong to. Um, so it's very important for for anyone who joins ASCAP to uh, get their, um, their musical house in order. Um, so when they join as a writer, um, they should also join as a publisher if they don't have a publishing deal because ASCAP pays um, royalties to 50% to, to writers and 50% to publishers. So if, if, if you join ASCAP, you should join as a writer and a publisher um, so you get all the, the royalties you deserve. Um, you know, registering your, your music um, properly is is the only way you're going to get paid, which is uh, essential. Um, so you need when you register your titles, you need to tell us who who wrote the music. If you have co-writers, all the splits have to add up to 100 percent. 
um, and you have to have um, you know the names in the of, of the co-writers in the publishing companies um, correctly uh, you know um, registered with ASCAP. Um, for for composers, um, you have to do all that the same thing to make sure you get paid. But uh, in, for for composers, um, we get cue sheets from production companies that um, will list the music that they used in their productions. But it's all, always good for composers to get copies of cue sheets just um, so they have a record of, of what music gets played. Um, so, you know, we have uh, agreements with uh, sister PROs around the world. Um, so when, when your music gets played in uh, other countries, um, you know, our sister PROs collect the data and, and, and send it back to us. And the same goes the other way when, when we monitor performances of foreign music here in the States, um, we make sure that, um, you know, foreign writers get their share of the music as well. Totally caught so, me off guard. It, there, so. You know, <laughs> go ahead. That's Eric. okay. Um, um, so, you know, Paying, paying songwriters and composers and music publishers for their music is, is, is the core of what we do. Um, we, we also, um, you know, support our members however they need to be supported. And, and that is, you know, in many more ways today than ever before. Um, we have uh, educational programs um, that we, uh, that, uh, you know, we educate our members on, on you know, not just uh, in creative ways, but uh, you know about the business, um, financial, um, you know, advice that they need. They need, and uh, you know, just how to navigate the, the music business today. Um, you know, for 15 years we had a we had a, a conference called the ASCAP I Create Music Expo. This year we went um, virtually, like this conference. Um, we called it the ASCAP Experience Home Edition. Um, um, for eight weeks this summer, we presented 31 panels. Um, we drew over 10,000 live stream viewers from 121 countries and, uh, you know, thousands, you know, watched uh, the content on demand. Um, and um, that stuff's all up on our, our website for anyone who wants to go and check out some of that programming. It's at uh, askhepexperience.com. Excellent. And I think with, with that summary from all of our panelists, we're going to open up the floor for Q&A. Uh, please post your questions in the chat box, which uh, at least on my screen is located in the lower right hand corner. Uh, we'll uh, basically sift through those and uh, try to get your questions answered here. But while your questions are coming in, I'll, I'll go ahead and give my little quick dog and pony show. Uh, I'm with the Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts. We are, we are a VLA, a Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts organization. There's actually 42 of us in the United States of America. They are uh, nonprofit organizations that are designed to funnel the skills and uh, expertise of the legal community to the creative community. So if you will, uh, we have about 1,500 volunteers on our rosters. They are lawyers who uh, specialize not necessarily in music law, but in all aspects of of law. And if an artist or a creative, any creative of any type needs assistance, they'll come to us. We basically translate the artist's needs from art speak to law talk uh, and uh, communicate that to the volunteers. The volunteers then come back and say, oh, I can handle that case. I did a contract like that over breakfast yesterday. Uh, we would connect you directly with that attorney and you would work in lockstep with them moving down the line. Now, this is a pro bono, a free service. And I'd love to tell you that attorneys do this for, out of the goodness of their heart, but uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, in many jurisdictions, attorneys have to do a certain number of pro bono hours during the course of the year to keep their license. So uh, we channel that energy again to your benefit. So anybody out there who is looking for any type of legal assistance, be it uh, a criminal or civil case, be it intellectual property, be it uh, contractual negotiations, be it leasing issues, uh, an eviction notice, something that's going on, please, by all means, contact the VLA in your jurisdiction. And again, they're usually located in most of the major cities. Um, there's a, uh, also a website you can go to, which I'll post a little bit later down here, where you can locate the VLA in your area. But we are Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts. We deal with Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Maryland. It's kind of a large geographic footprint for us. So with that, uh, let's go to the questions. So for Q&A, uh, Eric, I'm going to come back to you first. Um, what does an independent songwriter need to do after joining ASCAC to ensure that they're set up to be paid for performances in their music? What do they need to do? Unmute, please. Uh, 
Um, well, as, as, I, as I mentioned before, it's absolutely essential that um, when you join ASCAP, you join as a writer and a publisher if you don't have a, a, an arrangement with a publisher already um, because we split um, royalties 50% for the writers, 50% for the publisher um, entity. Um, you got to register all your titles, make sure all the details are correct because if, if there's one thing that's, that's off, then um, you know, we can't properly pay everyone who should get uh, a portion of, the, of, of those royalties. Um, and this can all be done at ascap.com. When you join, you can um, you get a, a member access and you can control all the information regarding your music. Um, and then, you know, we do all the rest. Um, you know, songwriters, um, you know, they have to register their works. Composers have to register their works. Um, and composers are worked a little differently if you write music for, for visual media like film and TV. Um, we usually, ASCAP will get sheets from production companies that list your music so um, it's important that you know you get all the details correct so that we can um, we can get our composers paid um, when we get those uh, cue sheets from the production companies sure sure um, there was a, a sort of a follow-up here from Eric Priest uh, he says uh, how important is copyright and copyright derived revenue for the smaller independent artists you all interact with you do can you speak to that you've seen what kind of percentages of uh, income we're talking about yeah, so it's funny. We got our quarterly uh, income from the artists. Uh, we help, you know, do their accounting. And it, it adds up. Again, I think, you know, Eric could probably speak to this as well. You know, I, I tell artists, especially producers and, and songwriters, just make sure you're getting your points. Make sure you're, you're getting stuff registered and you're following up. Because uh, a duo that we represent from the DMV, uh, Boomscat, uh, wrote a song two years ago that was on a random EP that they released, uh, mostly live performances, and it got picked up on an HBO show. And, you know, they got a pretty good check today out the blue because the the quarter one royalties were released, you know, this week. So, you know, again, when you, when you talk about needing $100 to pay rent or a couple hundred dollars, you're short to cover your car note, especially in these tough times, to get that random, you know, $300 check because your song was used on an HBO film that played over and over again, you know, every time the song played, I think they made something like $2.30 and it played multiple times because it's, it's on repeat. You know, that's an example to me where I think people don't understand like Boomscat probably has 70 songs in their, their entire catalog, but that one song getting picked up for that one random film, you know, was able to pay a bill this month. And, and for a writer, composer, producer, artist, you know, it, it, everyone wants, who doesn't want the massive, you know, super success, you know, millions and millions of plays and streams and billions of plays and streams. But when you come down to earth and you realize if I could just consistently make sure that I'm doing the right accounting and administration for every record, you just never know which one record's going to get you that decent check. And I'll take yeah. $300 any day as a writer producer. Yeah. And I'd, I'd piggyback on that and say, Eric, my advice would be you get out of it what you put into it. If you are protecting all of your work, all of your work, at the at when you write it, you know, at the inception, so that it's protected throughout the life of the work. If it ever gets picked up, and who knows what's going to hit, you don't know, then you're going to get paid for it. Um, and it's a, it's all a matter of that. I mean, this is a music business, people. You really kind of need to know where your revenue sources are going to be, what where you can make money on it. I know that it was an epiphany for me earlier in my career. Uh, I went in for a recording session. We laid down one track on some kind of jingle thing. Turns out that the the bite was picked up by an internet service provider in South America. I never even saw, I mean, I never saw the ad, but apparently it was an internet ad that ran for a long time. All of a sudden, you know, I got a $60 check one day, then I got a $380 check, then I got a $2,000 check. Turns out $24,000 later for 15 minutes of work, simply because I dotted the I's and crossed the T's and made sure that I was going to get residuals and payment on it. So, you know, you never know where it's going to come from. I think it's uh, important that you all understand how it works, where your revenue streams are and how to monetize that so you can continue to make music. Okay. I, I, can I just Eric, add something ahead. there? I would just say that, um, you know, there, so many people co-write and, and when you sit down in a room and, you, and you're bouncing ideas off each other, um, you know, you come up with a song, uh, you know, a lot, you know, historically a lot, a lot of these things are done with like a, a, a gentleman's handshake, you know, like, um, but it's absolutely, uh, it's vital um, for your career 
to approach it in a professional way and to make sure that when you do walk out of a room and you've written a song with other people that you've agreed to how much each person is going to get from that writing session. Um, and it all has to equal 100%. So if someone needs a, a few extra percentage points, when you go to register that title, it all has to be nice and clean. It has to equal 100%. And you're, you're, you know, you'll get paid um, much easier that way if you if you approach it, you know, from the very beginning in a very professional way. Yeah, and often when it comes to money, that gentleman's handshake often becomes a fist, um, <laughs> either holding on to money or wanting to be combative in terms of uh, getting hold of that that bread that's available. Uh, Jennifer, I'm going to uh, move on to you now, if, if you could just tell us a little bit at the, about the challenges and issues uh, in this industry that are unique to the music industry and their impact on on artists. If I could ask you to unmute, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, you'd think after seven months, I just would <laughs> not be challenged <laughs> yeah, by yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we know that musicians face unique challenges and inher inherent to the industry. Um, there's a lack of financial stability. There's instability in terms of folks who are on tour. Instability on tour means how are they maintaining relationships, whether it be relationships at home or relationships with their band families that become quite um, important to them. Um, isolation is, is paramount as a musician. There is, you get into the regular routine of poor sleep, of poor nutrition, that then leads to um, an adverse effect on cognitive abilities. I think there is um, a pressure to be creative on demand. And I think with the advent of social media, you know, everything is instant. So you can be playing and you're not even finished and people are commenting on you, commenting already. So, um, I've talked to artists and, and the question is, how do you manage that? Because it raises such stress to have to go back. You've got to, you know, read your review the next day in the paper. You can't do that anymore. It's like happening live. Um, certainly prevalence of drug and alcohol misuse. It's an industry hazard. I think that we need to dispel the myth of the tortured artist. We all know that some of the, the greatest songs have come out of um, uh, from minds that were not uh, sober, if you will. Um, but we have to dispel that myth um, because people buy into it. And I think more so now, the industry as a whole is really minding what mental health is and that they have to address mental health. Um, and we see that because conferences are putting on panels around mental health. Um, labels are talking about mental health. Um, and so there's an uptick in talking about mental health and we can no longer ignore it. Um, another issue is access to healthcare and mental health care. Limited insurance, lack of insurance and that then spirals because if somebody doesn't have time, somebody doesn't have the finances, they say, how, how can we then address this? And that leads back to just this constant feeling of stress. Um, and it speaks directly to Dr. Zen's study um, that there's all this pleasure in providing music, but the person providing the music, they have to mind self care in order to provide the music. Um, you know, I think certainly now it's such a precarious time for musicians, as we all know. And with these pre-existing stressors, it's, it's nearly impossible to manage the stress. And all this stress existed before COVID. So, you know, we're, we're really seeing how some of the transitions people are needing to make. But I can tell you at Music Care's mental health is... Um, it's a pivotal issue that we address, that we encourage people to, to take care of, that we have panels on, seminars. Um, you know, I think interestingly enough, we see what's happening in society 
and that affects one's mental health. And I, I think a great example is after the Harvey Weinstein story broke, that month I must have received four or five phone calls, um, people who were requesting therapy. They didn't have the means to get it on their own. They were triggered while they were on tour. And two of them canceled their tours because they just could not manage. And that's pretty significant to say, I'm gonna cancel a tour. No, I mean, that's unheard of. Um, so Music Cares was able to step in. We paid somebody's rent and we paid for um, a limited number of sessions for somebody for therapy. But you can just see the, the, how mental health is affected because every step along the way, there seems to be some sort of obstacle. And now people are home, they can sleep, they can eat correctly, they can um, be with the people in their immediate families, but they're not used to it. And so that's stress too. Um, so th th there's a lot of, um, we can't ignore how mental health affects the industry. And we've seen obviously the prevalence of suicide and people ending their lives um, and the more labels talk, the more managers talk, the more um, band leaders talk and say, hey, are you okay? Just asking the question, um, that's what needs to happen. And just mind that this is an issue that cannot be ignored. I would just, I would just add that in, in our own, in ASCAP's community, um, we are seeing a, a, a greater, um, um, you know, an increase in, in people talking about these issues. Our members are actually, you know, acknowledging that they're struggling. And, and I think the more people do that, the more that they share that we're all going through this and they, you know, they do it in a public way, then I think it's the stigma of, of that goes away and, and we can all work on it as a, a community. And to, yes, to normalize it. Absolutely. Right. All right, uh, Eric, I'm gonna put up uh, on the chat box, the uh, Music Unites Us website. Um, everyone, uh, I think we touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, this website provides a curated list of links for coronavirus resources for music creators. I'll stick that up in the chat box there. And I, I wanna double you. back a little bit and sort of qualify a question. Does anybody out there have uh, actual numbers on um, which, <laughs> Uh, small and indie artists are actually getting paid any significant amount of copyright related revenues. Does anybody have any stats on that? Yeah, Professor Zan, do you have anything like that? Uh, I don't think I have it so far. Okay, okay. Anybody, we may need to follow up on, on that question with uh, a gentleman who posed a question earlier. So we'll try to get that information for you. Thank you. Um, so uh, Michelle asks, uh, why is there not greater advocacy for universal health care? on the behalf of the creative community. Seems like some organizations are doing it. We know we've certainly seen it with sag after and, after and some of the other organizations uh, who are a little more organized on that. Why are we not seeing that in the music community? Anyone? I know there's a big push now for labels to offer insurance um, and that's different. Um, I don't know how far it's gone. You do, perhaps you can speak to that, but I do know that uh, People have called us asking, you know, would we want behavioral health in there? Well, of course you want behavioral health in there. Um, but they're seeing that they have a responsibility in this. Yeah, no, I think the labels, all the round tables have had uh, great conversations around it. Again, the labels speak to that, the, the you know, the 1%, the, the top, top, top artists. Um, but I also know that we've been a part of, of recording academy conversations that, that spoke to how do we kind of mirror that, um, you know, musicians and, and, and film, because I know the comparison was between the SAG, uh, AFTRA, and, and, you know, it's very different to be an independent artist and to be a filmmaker. And I think we're all still navigating, especially as technology gets, uh, creates more creators and more musicians and more artists who can upload a song to SoundCloud or TuneCore and instantly become quote unquote a musician, you know, how do you kind of define the metrics that say, okay, you're official. I know Recording Academy always had the, you have to have five credits. Um, and then what is a credit in a, you know, non-physical world now? 
So it's just a matter of like, I think it's going to catch up, especially as technology kind of advances and the ability to track and, and, and provide opportunities and, and put those two things together of like, all right, if I register here, I'm an artist. If I join this, whether it's a union or whether I, whatever group it may be, uh, I'm now officially a part of this. And then through that union or group, I, I think within the next year or two, especially with mental health kind of being at the forefront, you will find more opportunities for independent artists who are part of a group or union uh, to get access to uh, universal health care. But again, that's that's a much larger conversation that politicians stand on stage and talk about that has to be figured out, I think, on a broader scale. And then you'll see a trickle down effect to focus groups like musicians. But I do know I've been a part of, I say, dozens of roundtables and meetings and conversations where it's at the forefront of like, you know, we, we can't consider ourselves poor artists if we're not providing these opportunities. How do we do it? So it's coming. It's just a matter of, of playing catch up. Indeed. Um, I'm going to uh, pivot just a little bit and just talk about um, something a little bit more uh, pressing right now. And this is, um, I know you guys have seen that they're trying to get another CARES Act uh, passed through uh, legislation right now. And I wanted to make everyone aware that there is a bill on the table. It is called the Mixed Earner Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Act. And this specifically uh, addresses a lot of problem that a lot of musicians are having is that if you ever picked up uh, a 1099 and a W-2, you may have been deemed ineligible for pandemic relief funding uh, through the federal program because of, you know, you're showing that you're actually employed by someone and not an independent artist. So uh, Congressman Adam Schiff, uh, who's uh, representing California's 28th district, we know who Schiff is, we've seen him in the news all the time. He has uh, presented a bill right now uh, called the Mixed Earner Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Act. And it is uh, currently uh, moving through the House and the Senate. And under these rules, mixed earners who are in a combination of traditional W-2 and self-employment um, would be eligible for up to $300 a week of unemployment insurance or unemployment assistance. Uh, and that the way the legislation's worded right now is that it is retroactive. So it would actually go back to the beginning of this whole mess and you would hopefully get paid for that. Now it's run into a couple of snags along the way, but um, I know the Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts as well as a lot of other VLAs uh, have all jumped in to sign on to this. And I would encourage you to contact your legislator uh, and say that you are in support of let's getting artists paid uh, who definitely have been uh, you know excluded from this entire assistance project. So uh, if anyone wants any information on that, you can contact Adam Schiff's office. Again, he's with California's 28th district. And there's a little news piece for you there. Um, let's see, what do we got in the comments section? I do see a question about uh, if if the internet is working for musicians, why aren't more musicians working professionally? Yeah. Uh, and I'd love to speak to that. I think that's been the whole MO of what my wife and I are, are pushing. Uh, I, like most of you, I, I, you know, 2000, 2001, when I was trying to break in as an engineer producer, there were no opportunities uh, unless you were tied to a major label. And, and those are very predatory relationships. So when we started our, our business in 2010, it was all about finding creative ways to, to finance and fund projects and put money in artists' pockets. And I just feel like in, in 2020, if, if you're an independent artist or musician or creator, there's so many more ways to make money now than I've ever seen. And it's, it's difficult. It's always going to be difficult. Um, but I, I truly believe, you know, if you look at, you know, as an artist we work with who, you know, probably couldn't sell out a, a 300 person venue, but he does a weekly live stream on Facebook and puts his uh, cash app, PayPal and Venmo. And, you know, he makes $500 a week from friends and family who tune in and, and tip him $5, $10, $50. I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but for a guy who owns all of his masters, who owns all of his IP and uses a free service like Facebook to do a live stream and have people tip him through platforms that take a 3%, you know, fee, like that didn't exist 15 years ago, 10 years ago, or even five years ago. So it's, it's one of those things where like, I just think if you're an independent artist and you're choosing to be independent, which every artist we work with, we implore them to you really look at the the opportunities that exist and not the hurdles. Cause I guarantee you these hurdles are nowhere near the hurdles that existed 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, the, the ability to, to secure brand partnerships, to come up with branded content, to sell merch directly on your store, your, your website, 
Uh, again, it's, it's, you know, the, the artists that I do know who are signed and have major deals and have millions of dollars backing them. A lot of those guys are in very predatory relationships where they don't own their IP. They don't own their, their music. Uh, and they're in debt, right? It looks nice. They get the playlist and they get millions of streams and they get really cool music videos. But at the end of the day, they're left with very little to show for it. So if I'm an independent artist, I'm looking at, you know, the word professionally as a freelancer and as a 1099 resident, as, as a business, because that's really what you are, is the second you learn how to make money, you are a professional, you're a business. And the second you learn to operationalize that and say, okay, I can make this much a year selling merch doing live streams with brand partnerships and through royalties, whether it's sales and streams or licensing and sync. That's really how artists have to start operating and moving and building the teams to help support that. So it, it, there, there are more opportunities today. And I, I know it cause I, I am with, and I'm an artist, but I'm with artists all day who, who look at the challenges of like, how do I, you know, survive for 0.0007 cents. I'm like, yeah, but that's just one Avenue. I'd give the music away if I knew I could sell a thousand t-shirts. So, you just have to, as an artist, kind of sit and look at your business model and you yourself as a business and say, how do I generate enough revenue to cover X doing these four or five things? T piano lessons, like uh, Ying, Ying said early on our call, like, you know, if you can teach guitar online on Zoom and make $30 an hour, that's a skill set that like through a computer, you could generate a couple thousand dollars a month with, a you know, you can advertise for free on social media. It's, you, you have to be, you have to think outside the box and not just can I make money selling music online? Because even the labels aren't doing that. that multiple, multiple revenue streams, yeah. Go yeah. ahead. So uh, online is just uh, one of the venues because I, I don't think online could replace other, uh, other ways. So uh, such as in our survey. So the uh, live performance, uh, is the biggest uh, source of musicians' income. Um, and actually COVID-19, yeah, so uh, this would def definitely result in uh, creative destruction in music industry. Uh, and I would recommend uh, Alan Kruger's book. So this is his last book because it was published uh, last June. Uh, like three months after he passed away. So he explored uh, buoy theory. Yeah, as you can see, my uh, response to Tim uh, Thousand, I'm not sure whether I pronounced his last name correctly. Uh, so he used the buoy theory to explain factors uh, that are most important to music. Um, yeah, so uh, such as those actual recorded products and touring and merchandises. So other uh, aspects are also very, very important and necessary um, for musicians to maintain their economic sustainability. So online is just one of the ways. And in our book, uh, we'll further explore uh, the buoy theory in COVID-19. What, what would that result in the uh, music industry. So there must be plenty of creative uh, destructions. Thank you. Well, good. I, I, I think uh, I know we're coming to an end here and I know I got to pass back over to Sean here pretty soon, but I, I would like to say that um, clearly there are resources out there to help you. Uh, if you. If you feel that you need help or if you need support, reach out to uh, any one of the things that we've posted over in the chat list, uh, I know I speak for myself and hopefully from the panelists as well, that you can reach out to us and our organizations uh, for assistance in, uh, in getting you through this and getting the career uh, going that you're, that you're hopefully uh, aiming to have for. So I, uh, at this point, I'd like to thank our panelists again. I'd like to thank Jennifer and Ying and Eric and you do. Thank you so much for your professional advice and your expertise and wisdom. We appreciate you spending the time today. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. Sean, back to you. Great, John. Thanks so much. Thanks all the panelists too. As I said, this really was arguably the most important panel. And I'll say with, again, a little personal experience, I left music way back in the day, not just for the economics of it, but also because as much as music saved my life, when literally as a teenager, young adult, a lot of issues going on, a lot of you can probably relate to that. Music just took me to another place. But unfortunately, the rock and roller lifestyle back then was uh, I realized by my late 20s was unsustainable. 
And, you know, I wish I'd kind of gotten help back then and took care of some things that took a while to take care of. Instead, you know, the plan was to just leave it all behind completely and went out to the desert to study philosophy. Uh, didn't give anybody our forwarding address except for very close friends and family, and it was too bad. So I just had to push it all really far away because I couldn't figure out another way out of the trap that it was doing. So I just encourage everyone listening and anyone who, you know, uh, finds out about this, go to Jennifer's organization, go to all the organizations out there and try to get, you know, the help you need to take care of these issues.